Jeremiah, actually, I'll announce that now, too. So, yeah, um, anybody online? Yeah, and you guys, too. So, Jeremiah was looking online. Yeah, I went to the... And, go ahead. If you go to MS Law's webpage and you go to Courses, Materials, Exam, Prep, most professors, there's links to all the professors' old exams. Mm -hmm. This class, for some reason, kind of fell between the cracks, and the latest exam is 2004. And I, I've submitted them all, so somewhere someone has so them all. I found, so I found Mick, who works with Pareto. He said he'll take care of it today. So I give it a couple days, and if it's not fixed, mm -hmm. we can... Yeah, just let me know, and I'll get after them. Um, because what you should do for studying purposes is say, you know, if you want to simulate, you know, practice exam, go to last year's exam. If you have time, you know, take that one. And then the year before and so forth. Um, you know, rather than going to the older ones because, you know, things change over the years. Yeah, I mean, all yeah. All the way back to 1992 on there. Yeah. 22 years. The thing is, some things stay the same, some things, you know, change. Uh, look at the Youthful Offender Act. You know, that changed in 96. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking at prior exams before 96, they, they'll be talking about transfer hearings, for example. Um, and 92 was the year that um, um, you gave the juvenile court the jurisdiction to terminate parental rights. So before 92, you had just care and protection in juvenile court, and if you needed to terminate parental rights, you had to go just under 210 in probate court. So there have been, you know, a lot of changes over the years in, in, in this area of law. And actually, one of the changes we'll talk about today when we go, get to the U.S. Supreme Court cases, you know, that dealt with um, um, not only doing away with sentences such as the death penalty and, and mandatory life, but as part of those decisions, considered you know the culpability um, of of juveniles. But before that, we've got the early cases to look at, and I think your first case was MacGyver. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Who wants to tell me just a little bit about MacGyver, and we'll get through these, uh, Janita? Okay. So. Um MacGyver was charged with, uh, let me what the other guy It really doesn't matter. Right, so that one, okay, good. <laughs> um, that one was about um, whether due process should be um, granted to um, juveniles who were on, in a, in a criminal proceeding, pretty much. So they talked about other cases like Galt, um, where they said that the 14th Amendment or the Bill of Rights is for adults only. They also spoke about um, Winship, where they said that um, the due process clause protects the accused against conviction except for, um, except upon proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and then they said that that standard was also applicable, applicable excuse me, also during the adjudicatory, adjudicatory stage of a delinquency proceeding. But then after all of that, um, that case held that it was not. What was not? Um, due process was not. What do you mean by due process? Because there's all kinds of things that fall under due process. I'll tell you in one second. Did, what, what, didn't the case just say that it wasn't a constitutional right to what was a, jur it? a jury trial? A jury, jury trial. trial, yes. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, you know, when we started the semester with the Gall case, and we talked about um, that being sort of um, the wellspring for, for children's rights, you know, the court looking at, you know, how the juvenile court began in 1899 as this informal uh, place where, you know, the court um, looked to not punishing uh, juveniles, but protecting and rehabilitating them and the whole notion of parents patriae. Um, but as you saw with the, not only the reading of the golf case, but the uh, simulation that we did in class, that that sometimes is a little, you know, ends up hurting juveniles more if you're not giving them, you know, at least some of the same constitutional rights as adults have. So in, in Galt, that was also decided around that time, 70, 71, um, what were the four rights that the U.S. Supreme Court, just to review, um, that the US, U.S. Supreme Court held that all juveniles should have in the adjudicatory phase, as Jadita said, of a delinquency proceeding. What did God the for, for rights? Anybody remember? I think, did I ask you to look at it again? I think that I did. <laughs> Last class, I said, let's look at God again. 
What did Jerry get? You know, what did Jerry not get? Remember, Janita? <laughs> Notice of charges. Notice. Right to counsel. Right to counsel. Right to confrontation or cross examination. Yeah. And right against self incrimination. And privilege against self incrimination. Okay. Those four rights, and you should know that by heart. If there's anything you memorize, it should be the four rights that all juveniles are afforded um, pursuant to the Gulf case. And it's, the Gulf, and it's from the Gulf case that other rights, you know, in other states and the U.S. Supreme Court going forward has either taken a look at the juvenile proceedings, as in McGovern versus Pennsylvania and said, you know what, maybe we shouldn't go as far as adults. Because what was the rationale in MacGyver, Ash, in, in terms of not affording a jury trial? Because you know, jury trial is also an important constitutional right that adults are afforded. But according to MacGyver v. Pennsylvania, it's not constitutionally required for juveniles. So why not? Why not? Why not? Why don't they get jury trials? Or why shouldn't they get jury trials as a, a federal uh, a standard? It's not criminal. Yeah, so what was some of the rationale that the Supreme Court talked about in MacGyver? Because you kind of lose that intimate, informal hearing that you should get um, with, a, with, a, with a child being tried. Here's a quote from the dissent in Gaul. I hope I brought it with me. Uh, I was just reading it, and yeah, they were trying to argue that it was substantially similar, similar to a criminal trial, so it should be afforded the right to have a jury. Say that again, Ash. That um, the, they argued that it was substantially similar to a criminal trial. Who stay? The, the appellant, the juvenile in 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 MacGyver said, "You know what? I I I should get a jury trial, saying like adults, because what's at stake? His, what his, what right? His right to freedom, liberty, liberty. right? Yeah. Right? Liberty, liberty, property. Yeah. <laughs> like liberty, property, right? Um, listen to this. This is a, a Justice Stewart um, who predicted in the Gall dissent." that um, if you keep going on affording you know, the juveniles all of the same due process rights as adults, um, he talked about that you're gonna you know, take juvenile courts away from rehabilitation and protection and start making them look, you know, why even have a juvenile court? Because then all you need is an adult court because it's the you know, same rights, same process, et cetera. And this is what Stewart said, and I'm just, um, I know I sometimes don't like to read and read out loud, people don't listen, but I think it's a great quote. The inflexible restrictions that the Constitution so wisely made applicable to adversary criminal trials have no inevitable place in the proceedings of those public social agencies known as juvenile or family courts. And to impose the courts, so he's talking about the rest of his court, and to oppose the, I'm sorry, impose the court's long catalog of requirements upon juvenile proceedings in every area of the country is to invite a long step backwards into the 19th century. In that era, there were no juvenile proceedings. So he's talking about before there was a juvenile court. And a child was tried in a conventional criminal court with all the trappings of a conventional criminal trial. So it was that a 12-year-old boy named James Guild was tried in New Jersey for killing Captain Beeks. A jury found him guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. The sentence was executed. It was all very constitutional. What did uh, this is I'm reading from the Gulf Dissent. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what does that mean in terms of what we're looking, you know, looking at some of these, these decisions that you're reading today? Obviously, there's a um, um, uh, matter of windship that imposes a, you know, a similar adult-like right in terms of the burden of proof. But MacGyver goes the other way and doesn't afford the right to jury trial. So tell me what you think of that quote. What does that quote mean? I, th I think what he's saying is that if we give juvenile 
trials all of the same rights as adults. It starts to become very sanitized, very, as long as we follow the rules, we don't think about anything else. And what I think the, what I think that quote saying is we still have to remember these are kids. Just because we give them rights doesn't mean we can treat them as adults because, like he said, that trial a 12-year-old boy was murdered because they followed all the rules and they said, hey, that's okay. Yeah, same, same, same procedures, same punishment. Right, and it's that. all very constitutional. Very, you, and I just want to add to what he said. If if they're giving all the rights that the adults are given, then where where's the the distinction from juvenile court mm -hmm. to adult court? Yeah. Now remember that juvenile court was created as a separate court right. in 1899. A separate court. So the the. Uh, um, Critiquers, you know, of affording, you know, the full panoply, as they say, of constitutional rights would side with Stewart. Say, you know, at, at that point, yeah, sure, it's constitutional, but you, you know, you're going back to an era before there was a juvenile court, and the whole reason for the juvenile court is that juveniles and adults are different, and you're going to see that with the Roper and the Simmons and the brain development. Case. We're kind of coming back to the beginning of the juvenile court and recognizing the biological, scientific, neuro, uh, you know, neurological, um, sociological, all of those differences between juveniles and adults. We give those rights to the adults because the punishments are so high and it's, there's so much at stake. When you're talking about juvenile, you're, we're supposed to be referencing rehabilitation and different aspects of it. So are those rights that necessary if that's what we're looking for? Now, what else should you know about trial by jury in terms of delinquency and youthful offender cases that I talked about on Tuesday? So we have MacGyver v. Pennsylvania where the U.S. Supreme Court says, no, nope, you, you don't have trial by jury. That's not your right uh, because you're different. But what else do you need to know about trial by jury in Massachusetts? Don't you get that option. Because you get that option under what? Um, what would you cite? And you don't have to cite the specific subsection, but um, under um, section 56. That's what I just said. You don't have to uh, cite this. So if you were writing about it in an exam or talking to somebody about it, what would you say, generally speaking? Generally. The, the U.S. Supreme Court has held the bar, but Massachusetts such and such. So fill in the blanks for me. Sometimes. General laws legislature. Uh, go ahead. Massachusetts legislature has allowed it. Has so allowed it, and you might go. You know, you might just say, in chap, you know, chapter 119 that governs the care and protection of uh, juveniles, and specifically the delinquency and the youthful offender statute. Even if you don't remember Ash, the specific subsection, you know that Massachusetts has afforded more rights, but it's a statutory right that we've afforded in terms of jury trial. So it wasn't the SJC making that decision; it was, it's the statute that affords these kids um, jury trials. By the way, no more jury trial for, it, it, it's weird, and I don't even know when and if. I've never encountered a Chins jury trial, but they used to have it in the statute that um, not only the jury trial, but the, uh, the de novo um, system, but that's been done away with in the, um, in the statute as well, okay. So the next Supreme Court case is Shaw versus uh, Martin. Um, with sort of a similar rationale, again, and that's much later, 1984. Um, what was going on in Shaw v. Uh, um, Martin that um, the Supreme Court um, decided whether it was constitutional or not? It was in, out in New York, Lester. <laughs> well, let me look at my notes. I don't remember the name. It was a delinquency case. The New York Family Court Act authorized certain kinds of procedures. Anybody remember what they were? Something to do with pre-trial de detention? It, a absolutely not something to do, but pre-trial detention, preventive detention, right, for juveniles. Anybody know more about that? There has to be whether it violated the due process. Well, tell, tell, can you tell us a little bit more about this? <laughs> well, Ash cut in, so it looked like he knew. Right 
why pretrial detention? What, what, what did it do? It, it relates to, a, I guess, a legitimate state interest. Well, you, you go to the rationale, but tell me a little bit more about the act itself. Why didn't New York provide for pre-trial detention? Anybody know? Because of no due, due process? I'm asking a factual question, and you're all answering me with, with arguments, with, with, with rationales. I'm just asking what the act, the New York Act, oh, provided. Oh, it provided, you know, you tell me pretrial detention, but tell me more rule. about it. What's that? The three day rule. It, it has to be a hearing within three days on the, on the merits. Yeah, but why? I, again, on what basis? Um, did the New York Act allow juveniles to be detained before trial, Richard? If there was a belief that there was a serious risk that the juvenile yeah. would commit what would be considered a crime by an adult. Right. It, it, the, during the time before he goes to trial. During the time before he goes to trial. It almost sounds like a dangerous it, 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 it does in a way. So, you know, let's, let's hold him and make sure, you know, nothing happens in the interim. So now you guys can tell me about what you started to say. What did the Supreme Court say about this act and its constitutionality and what was the rationale? So Lester said something, Patricia or Jeremiah, when you guys said something. It's so maybe go back. So what does that mean? Um, he didn't get any due process of law, so they didn't get notice, they didn't get... No, 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 no. What did the Supreme Court hold about the New York Act? You're giving me what his argument was, okay. which, which is great. The court kind of shot that down, right? It violated the due process clause. The Supreme Court said it violated the due process clause? Oh, did Notice not. my tone. Uh, Notice my question. No. <laughs> it did not violate. It did not violate the due process clause. Why not? <laughs> oh boy, today is like. <laughs> I have to really draw it out, you guys, today. Why? Why is preventive detention okay for juveniles when it may not be okay for adults? Because they need. Why? Just think about it. You know, and again, you think about it just in general terms of the juvenile court and juveniles. Um, is, it, is, it, is it because um, they consider the best interest of the juvenile? juvenile yeah, as yeah. well as the need of protection. And what? The need for the protection of the community. Yeah, yeah. Is that it? Absolutely. Protecting both the, and when you think about it, doesn't it sound similar to when we talked about the Youth Offender Act the other day, the, the um, interest of the public, the safety, uh, the safety issue, you know, as well as the rehabilitation slash protection of the juvenile. Again, the rap, and simply put, MacGyver and Shaw are, are, are just based on the notion that juveniles and adults are different. They're different, and because they're different, we, you know, we want to look to, you know, other reasons than, than, you know, the con the, the full panoply of constitutional protections that adults normally get. Richard, and the, and the court also said that merely detaining someone isn't a due process violation because they were still given notice. They were given hearing. That's right. Yeah. The that, that's when Lester mentioned the three-day rule before. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Winship, now we're going the other way in terms of due process rights. So what does Winship stand for in a, in a sentence? What does Winship stand for, Lester? Well, it should a youthful offender be adjudicated as an adult or with the same 
due process as an adult. What's the holding of Winship? That might have been some of the considerations leading up to the holding, right? So adjudication of delinquency is by, should the standard of proof is uh, beyond a reasonable doubt? Yeah, I mean, it, to us it's such a given, right? Because we've been talking about beyond a reasonable doubt since the beginning of the semester, but 1970, it's not that long ago in terms of the jurisprudence of juvenile law. 1970 is when the Supreme Court said, you know, that, that you, you've got to use the same standard of proof the, that adults have in criminal proceedings for proceedings that are criminal like for juveniles because of the loss, remember the 14th Amendment, the loss of their liberty. They're constitutionally entitled to proof beyond a reasonable doubt when they're charged with violation of a criminal law. Now as we mentioned before with you know golf being the wellspring and started this all off and Massachusetts affording more rights, Massachusetts in the chins and the CRA, which is not violation of criminal law, um, still affords juveniles the proof beyond a reasonable doubt standard for the um, for the status offenses that you know Michael Kelly and then us had talked about. Um, so we give more more rights in, in in that respect because they're not criminal actions, right? The CRAs so running away. Uh, not being at school, not being home, being truant. None of those are criminal offenses. However, statutorily in Massachusetts, the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt for the for the CRAs as well. But that's all that's all Winship stands for. So uh, again, th these were cases that were um, are sort of coined as the juvenile, um, sorry, the constitutional rights era of the child that was around the 70s, leading up to the 80s. Um, the states that to follow suit, you know, in their statutes as well after that. Um, a little bit earlier was Kent v. United States. Dealt with waiver to the adult court. Who wants to handle um, Kent? I just had questions of concern that I didn't have to read that. That was traumatic. They interrogated him for seven hours. Talk a little louder, Patricia. I'm they, sorry. they interrogated him for seven hours without a break. They sentenced him to sixty to ninety years in prison, and then he had a. Uh, they had a psychopathology that said he was insane and put him in the Saint Elizabeth's Mental Hospital, uh, and he was sixteen years old. Okay. Just and, like and it was very archaic and primitive. It, and basically, evaluation. what was happening? The juvenile was waved over to adult court, right? Based on what? I'm sorry, transfer a juvenile to be tried as an adult. They're entitled to a hearing. They're entitled to a hearing. And then the factors that are enumerated in Kent, again, are very similar to the factors in our wild sentencing hearing today. And they were also very similar to the old factors in, you know, in the old transfer hearings. Seriousness of the offense, uh, how it was committed, you know, aggressive, violent, blah, 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 uh, whether it was against per persons, property. Um, I'm just looking at some of them. Uh, the record and previous history of the juvenile, uh, the protection of the public, likelihood of reoffending. You know, all of those things, the Supreme Court is saying that the judge, you know, back then, that was a transfer hearing um, where the judge sort of indiscriminately, you know, made a decision based on, you know, not enough. So that was the case that set the standard for if you're going to try them and give them adult punishments, you've got to look at these factors. And the factors, while they go to the offense, they also go to the juvenile's character, ability, uh, um, you know, um, I'm sorry, medical, family, school, all of that. And that's what Kent uh, stands for. Reed v. Jones was a 75 uh, Supreme Court case, again, decided right in that era. What did 
Supreme Court decided B.B. Jones. It was a case, uh, we brought between the director of the California Youth Authority and a juvenile. Um, they found the juvenile had been guilty of a call, well, adjudicated in juvenile court, but they felt that he wasn't amenable to treatment in a juvenile court. He was court. already adjudicated in juvenile court, and then... And then they brought him forward again to try him in adult court, and even though he never faced uh, the possibility of two punishments, they said the mere fact that he had to go through two trials and bring his resources and the strain that it put him under of two trials, they, uh, they stated it was double jeopardy. Yeah, so double jeopardy, uh, again, a right um, previous to this that was um, you know, afforded only adults. Supreme Court decides in 75, the double jeopardy clause applies to juveniles um, as well. You have to be careful though, you know, in terms of a, a, a school punishment and a delinquency punishment, that's not double jeopardy, correct? So the school can punish by, you know, up to expulsion, the juvenile can still be uh, uh, criminally prosecuted through a delinquency or wild complaint, and that's not double jeopardy. Because you one, guys understand that, right? Because yeah. one is an, admin, an administrative hearing, and the mm -hmm. other is an adjudication. Through. Exactly, exactly. Um, two separate, you know, systems the school system and the, and the penal system. So he's not being you know, penalized t twice in terms of the court system, and that's what double jeopardy would be, you know, being tried for the same offense t twice. Um, you're not technically tried for the offense by the school, even though you are being punished, but it is a different um, sort of punishment. What do you guys have next? Is it the Roper case on your... Um, Yes. Okay. All right. I want to spend a little bit more time now with um, with um, Roper, and then you have uh, Granby, Florida, and Miller v. Alabama. Correct. Yep. Okay. Now, um, before Roper was decided, and you don't have that case, and you don't need to, but um, some of you may have read in Con Law the. Um, uh, Atkins v. Virginia, the case that uh, did away with the death penalty for the mentally retarded. Does that case ring a bell to any of you? No. Okay, well, you, it doesn't need to, but other than you know that, but, you know, before the Supreme Court decided for juveniles, the Supreme Court had decided for the mentally retarded that the uh, death penalty was unconstitutional for mentally retarded. So it was sort of right. Uh, for the plucking in terms of the Roper case coming up before the court, um, as well as it was around that era that um, research had begun in terms of brain development of juveniles. And I've been saying that all through the semester, but we really haven't talked about it that much. And I'm not a scientist, but um, and I have a little difficulty, you know, sort of understanding the, the science behind it. But I will tell you that, um, you know, the brain develops. It doesn't get bigger. It um, does this myelin, myelin. I can't pronounce myelination. it. Myelination. You got it. Say it, Patricia. Myelination. <laughs> exactly. Um, where more, it's either more gray or more white matter develops. But um, <laughs> right? the adults, we, you know, when we think our executive functions belong in the, this frontal lobe, and it's the frontal lobe that's undeveloped for kids. And actually, you know, um, you, you've heard of MRIs. Well, there's fMRIs that. Um, scientists actually began to look at kids and adults' brains and saw this. And that um, when, uh, in terms of kids too, that they, because the frontal lobe is uh, uh, not developed, and I'm saying this very simplistically, there's lots of stuff out there and I refer, I have a lot of footnotes in the article that I gave you that I uh, had written on life sentences, that's in your section as well. Um, but juveniles um, uh, um, rely on what their amygdala, which is the limbic system, and it's more like, I think of it as like animals. <laughs> and, you know, not to be rude or, you know, but that's what it is. You know, they're thinking and acting more from emotion than, than really planning, etc. Um, they don't have the high level thinking skills. 
Simmons. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So when the Roper v. Simmons case uh, came up to the Supreme Court, you know, um, besides just the traditional arguments about Eighth Amendment, um, the court also considered and looked at many amici uh, also had filed briefs at the time, um, um, you know, looked at the, um, the research. Uh, the research from Harvard, from UMass Medical, uh, the MacArthur Foundation, um, you might hear uh, Tom Griso, who's a, um, I think Tom Griso is UMass Medical, I forget where he's from, I think he, he's from here somewhere. Uh, he also worked in the MacArthur Foundation research. Um, and, and not only doctors, but uh, JDs as well got involved in, in all of this, and um, it's made a, um, a huge, impact on, we'll talk about the Supreme Court cases, but also just in terms of um, how practitioners now um, approach, you know, representing kids as well. So somebody tell me about Robert B. Simmons. Well, I had a qu question. Was he considered mentally retarded? Because I didn't see anything Who? here. No, no, no. That was the Atkins v. Virginia case okay. that you didn't read. Okay. That was decided before Robert B. Simmons and um, actually... I cited in my article, let me see if I have the site for you guys. You don't have to look it up, but um, it was 2002, actually. There it is, uh, footnote 28, um, 536 U.S. 304, Atkins. Uh, I'm sorry, what is it? 536 U.S. 304, 2002. I mean, you don't really need to read it for this class, but just know that that was the case where the, the Supreme Court held that the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendments pro prohibit the execution of a mentally retarded person. So it was a total ban, a flat ban. And we'll talk about the word flat ban when we get to Miller v. Alabama. Um, by the way, before Roper v. Simmons, I didn't give you what, there was an earlier case, and I think it was Eddings v. Of Oklahoma, um, cited somewhere in my article. Um, the court did, um, did decide that um, executing 14-year-olds was unconstitutional. But, you know, Roper, of course, raised the limit. So somebody tell me about, um, about what was Roper's first name? Was it Christopher? Donald. Donald. Donald, okay. Chris Simmons. Chris Simmons, that's right. Okay, somebody tell me about Roper. Oh, I'm sorry, Simmons, yeah, the, the kid is, is Chris. Oh, it's not Roper? No, Roper's the super Yeah, 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 Roper's the government. Okay. I always get that messed up, right? Christopher yeah. Simmons, was, Simmons is the kid. Yeah. yeah, so somebody tell me about him. Roper? <laughs> Simmons. Simmons. Simmons, okay. Well, Roper for Simmons is the case. <laughs> tell me about Christopher Simmons' history first, he was, he was 17. Yeah. And he committed murder. What did he do? Uh, it was particularly atrocious. That's why I want to ask. What did he do? It was first degree murder. I don't remember. The Lester, you, you remember what he did? I think he he and his buddies kidnapped a woman. Oh yeah. They duct taped her yeah. up. They threw her in a van. Yep. Her van. Took her up to the bridge. Bye bye. Threw yeah. her off the bridge. Mm -hmm. She couldn't breathe from the duct tape. Yep. But then she yep. drowned. As exactly. Well. All right. So, so continue. Was, so he was 18 years old when he was convicted of, of this crime mm -hmm. and sentenced to death. So um, the Supreme Court held that executing an individual who was under the age of 18 um, was prohibited by the 8th and 14th Amendment. Okay. So let's talk about some of the reasons and the rationale that the Supreme Court um, considered. Somewhere in the case, the court talks about this, these three general differences between juveniles under 18 and adults. One is the lack of maturity. The second, that they are uh, more vulnerable, I'm sorry, to outside pressure. And the third is they're not, they're, their character isn't well, isn't sure. well formed. I mean, and those are so basic. Um, I, again, built on you know the foundation of the juvenile court to even begin with. 
that's why I mentioned before, it's like the, these later cases are sort of a coming back to the beginning of the juvenile court um, era. What else does the Supreme Court um, talk about in terms of the punishment being a uh, violation of the Eighth Amendment? So heinous murder, as Lester just told us, no question that it was done, right, by this kid. Threw his victim off a bridge. Why does he not get the death penalty when someone, you know, um, I'm sorry, maybe a couple years reasons. older would? Don't they give three reasons? What's that? Don't they explain it, give it three different reasons? Well, that was the three I just gave you, but I want to talk about more of their, that, that has to do with the, the general differences, but that isn't the reason why the Eighth Amendment is violated. Let's think about, yeah. I think one of the reasons is that, given those three things, um, the capacity to commit a crime is different. So they don't have, they don't, I mean, I'm sorry, the way to put it would be their, their culpability for committing a crime is different because they um, they don't have the executive functions, they, they um, act impulsively. Um, What's the difference, and this is a little aside since you brought up culpability. What's the difference between competence to stand trial and culpability. I think culpability would be um, if, you know, when you mentioned this case about, I don't know anything about the case, but the, the juvenile with Asperger's who committed a murder. Yeah, I've and by the school. way, I talked about it in my article too. That's, that's the um, odd, odd one who had Asperger's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, having worked with, and, and, People who have Asperger's, that to me seem, seem like that could be a question of, well, culpability as opposed to capacity to be a witness or to give a waiver. Culpability is your how responsible you can be held for, uh, for a, a criminal act that you do. Okay. Another way to think about it, because you can get really confused. Culpability goes all the way back to the time of the offense, right? Whereas competence to stand trial is you today. Can you understand your counsel? Can you engage in a defense? Or are you, you know, mentally ill or under some kind of uh, disability that you cannot stand trial? Jadita, can you talk a little bit about, I know that your um, supervisor might have had a case where the, the, the kid could be incompetent Okay. Um, it's, um, it's it's horrible because a lot of these children, they don't really understand. What did he allegedly do to your client? Um, so many things. He's charged with armed robbery, rape, um, disturbing a school assembly, mm -hmm. um, so many things. There are a lot more than what I just said. But um, actually yesterday when Mike had to explain to him that because of the rape, he could be considered a youthful offender. <laughs> have to register. Oh, oh, the youthful offender as right. well. Yeah, yeah, both. Oh, and yeah. he didn't understand that even though he's only, he just turned 17, he can still be given an adult sentence. And once he reaches, I think, 21, excuse me, 21, he will be more in school. And exactly. What so we he, talked about the other day. With right. So I was just going to issue up there yesterday questioning him and asking him, does he understand the difference between the right. trial by jury, bench trial, all these things. And then once they explain to him that because of the rape charge he can be a youthful offender, he's like, oh, well, you lied to me. And he felt, he felt as if, you know, he was being lied to and he didn't really understand the difference between delinquency and mm -hmm. youthful offender and CRA. He has a CMP against the mom. There's so many different There's things. There's so many, of course. So many. Yeah. So now he, mm -hmm. um, for him, like, he's not competent to stand trial. And um, the issue was with, with the clinician, she, the, she had initially said he was. 
Okay. And she said that the first time she evaluated him, he started off, you know, he was he was shut down at the beginning, and then he kind of opened up and he started to understand. And yesterday when she started to question him, I initially thought he would be competent because when she asked him the differences um, in the trial by jury, bench trial, he was able to explain all of that. He explained what his lawyer is supposed to do for him and okay. so many things, but once it got to a youthful offender, he shut down. So they, the court takes all of that into consideration if the, the child doesn't really understand what the process is or what they're being charged with or what they can face as a result of what they're charged with, then these children don't stand trial. But the thing that sucks about that <laughs> is that if he's deemed incompetent, they just it's like a circle, it just keeps going around and yeah. around. Nothing the case really doesn't done. end, it just doesn't stays end. open. Exactly. And the person is not competent to stand trial. Oh, so you yeah. can't have a trial. Whereas with the culpability issue, you're using it uh, um, in terms of you know, for the most part, to, to, to I'm sorry, to mitigate, you know, to mitigate the punishment because of the nature and the character of the, of the person, the person's culpability. He said that they're working so, on a yeah, bill now. it's really uh, it sucks. weird. He said they're working the, on a bill now um, where, depending on the charge, if the child is deemed incompetent, they might just dismiss it. So hopefully, something like that comes up. So where do, where are they held? Yeah. So they're held, but nothing. They really may happens. be held, maybe yeah. not. Yeah, I mean, it depends. it depends. It depends on the charge. It depends on the the, the mental status of right. the child. The child could be in some sort of you know uh, uh, um, you know medical facility, uh, or the child could be home and just the case just keeps coming before the court and for status. And the status you know depending on the professionals will be still not competent to stand right. trial. And nothing gets. Yeah, so that's you know competence, culpability. It's you know it, 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 two very different things, but that you might you know encounter in the process of in, in representation of a kid. In that yeah. situation, what happens if you're dealing with a 17-year-old, or you know he's deemed not competent, but then we hit 18 or we hit 21 or something? They like still that. could be not competent. Still, still keep you know, going. Um, yeah. the same thing. So what's going to stop a child from knowing the system and just? You know. It's funny that you say knowing the system because studies have been done that um, you know people think of oh because they've been through you know so many times that doesn't mean that they really understand the, the you know the, the uh, you know all of the all of the processes exactly. Can yeah. I just add to that? Um, it's not even, I thought it was about knowing the system too, something I learned yesterday. Um, whenever they brought up the fact that he was charged with rape, he was like, don't say that, watch your mouth, watch your mouth. Huh. So they're like, uh, if they yeah. put him in a trial where they're talking about the rape, he can have an outburst and he can't exactly. sit through the trial. Yeah. So it's not even about knowing the system, it's about how they behave and, you know. <laughs> exactly. Can we just get back to the Eighth Amendment, though? Because the, you know that's a, 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 again a, a, a different standard. What is the Eighth Amendment? What does the Eighth Amendment provide generally, Jeremiah? Uh, protection from cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah. So it has to be cruel and unusual, right? So what has the Supreme Court looked at in terms of what cruel and unusual punishments mean? Well, in this case, they actually looked at other countries. Exactly. They look at consensus, national consensus, international consensus. Um, uh, proportionality is another issue. Does the crime, you know, fit the punishment? But then going back to the, these are horrible crimes. And that was the argument that uh, juveniles commit horrible crimes like these, they should have the same punishment as adults. You were saying something? They talked a lot about the UK and how it had abolished but death penalty for juveniles, I think 50 some odd years mm -hmm. part of this case. And they liked they liked the UK because they were saying that, you know, this is where our laws are based on. It was from, you know, United Kingdom law. So that was kind of it seemed like that was a heavy heavy influence for them. And remember the the um, um, adoption the uh, right to the child, the convention of the you know what I'm talking about, the international um, the United Nations Convention. Yes. I believe at the time it was only U.S. and maybe Somalia that still had uh, death penalty for kids from juveniles. So that was another thing that the court um, had um, had looked at. 
who just had their hand up. Did you, oh, okay. just that the, yeah. the men's radar is, is not the same mm -hmm. for a 17-year-old and a 27-year-old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And when you think about it, again, it makes sense in a very simplistic way, and it makes sense in terms of the reason for the juvenile court in the first place. Um, and yet, as the juvenile court evolved and there were crimes done by kids, the uh, um, processes became more and more adult-like with giving you know, rights that were like adults, but also giving punishments um, similar, similar to adults. Um, oh yeah, Steinberg was another guy. Steinberg, I think, is a lawyer. Actually, wait a minute. I, have, I know I relied on him too. But, um, Lawrence Steinberg. I think he was out of um, Chicago, maybe. But he was the first one that talked about the notion of less guilty by reason of adolescence. Less guilty by reason of adolescence. And that's, that's the thing. Yes, you know, uh, Chris Simmons, he did it. It was horrible, horrible crime. Um, and he should be punished in some way, um, but should he be punished the same way as adults because he is an adolescent and not and not an adult. Um, can the court, should the courts be able to look at mitigating factors in order to reduce, you know, in order to reduce the punishments? So that was the death penalty case. Then the court started to look at, obviously at the death penalty, life sentences. So Graham v. Florida was decided in just a couple of years ago. Miller was last year. Was Graham the year before? I think so. What's that? Oh, it was 11, okay. 10 and 11. Yeah, actually it was 2010. And Miller was last year, 2012. So somebody tell me about Graham v. Florida. Graham, uh, Graham and two other people robbed the barbecue restaurant in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> I'm sorry, sure. that, but the barbecue restaurant. Oh, it's so it's a barbecue restaurant. He was charged with uh, attempted robbery along with first degree robbery uh, or burglary with assault and battery. Uh, for the latter charge, he was tried as an adult um, and that crime in Florida carries a life sentence. Wasn't he like he was put on probation? He was, and then, he was sentenced, yeah. but he was out mm -hmm. and I think maybe two months later or a month right. later, he got charged for uh, basically home invasion. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, he said he wasn't guilty, but he stipulated to the violation of probation. And because Florida had outlawed, uh, I believe, parole in uh, life sentence cases, he was sentenced to life, uh, life in prison. Okay. Can, before you go to what the U.S. Supreme Court decided, can you tell us a little bit uh, about him, his life? Parents were drug addicts. Yeah. And he had ADHD. ADHD. Mm -hmm. How, he had ADHD. He drank and used what? drug, tobacco at uh, yeah. nine and marijuana yeah. at thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. So he had, you know, addiction issues. Yeah. Similar to Judita's client, um, across the board, engaged in um, from family life through school, through crimes, etc. So Richard just said he got life, mm -hmm. right? And then? Um, the court ruled that it was unconstitutional uh, under the Eighth Amendment to sentence a juvenile offender to life in prison for a non-capital offense. Flat ban? It didn't, you know say, it didn't say that it was, it was, a, it was a, a flat ban, it was that uh, Although you didn't have to give a specific amount of time, but they had to give a reasonable 
I think they refer to it as like an opportunity for release, that there was something that, you know, a juvenile offender should have some chance at a release prior to a life sentence. Yeah, sentence and of life was, uh, without parole for those who commit non-homicide crimes, for kids who commit non-homicide crimes, flat ban, unconstitutional across the board. And he was resentenced uh, later, I think, in 2012 to 25 years. Yeah. The sentence, again, in terms of Eighth Amendment, grossly disproportionate to the crime. One of the reasons of the court, as well as the whole adolescent brain development. Uh, I mean, but this rationale. is still this is still 2012, and it, it just strikes me as right. outlandish that in Florida. You can get the you you would never even imagine the sentence in Massachusetts. Right, getting life for armed robbery, exactly. Um, not even, not even twenty five years. I mean, the reality. Oh, six, oh, a sixteen year old in Massachusetts wouldn't have faced twenty five years. No, for robbery. No, no, you're right about that, Richard. So then Brian Miller. Brian was his first name, right? I think. Evan. Evan? Oh, okay. What did Evan do? John, what did Evan do? Um, he, uh, he, uh, let's see. He went over, um, uh, somebody, somebody that his mother knew came over to his house uh, and uh, had a drug deal with his mother, yep. and he followed him back to that guy's house. He asked him to go out and buy drugs for him. They were all drinking. And this, he was there with another friend of his who was also young, and that guy eventually passed out, and they decided to uh, take his wallet. And mm -hmm. I guess, I think it was Evan, he was reaching for the wallet, and the guy woke up, and um, then it's a little bit disputed, but um, whether Evan or his friend was hitting this guy, but they basically picked up a bat and they, yeah. beat, him, they yeah. beat him senseless. And then um, they were about to leave and they said, well, maybe we should light the place on fire to yeah. cover it up. So it was um, it was felony. I don't know, was it felony? Do they have felony murder? That's that's what happened. So they got, uh, the result of it was that the guy died. Yeah, yeah. And he had come from difficult circumstances. What was some of it, if you recall? A lot of uh, movement, movement around the issues, a lot of uh, drug abuse in the family. He himself had uh, mental health problems. He had committed suicide. Uh, he had attempted suicide. And, uh, and, you know, starting from when he was really young, and it just he, he had So now this case goes before the Supreme Court. The companion case, too, as well, with similar circumstances. I forget what that was. Um, both young, both 14, 14, 15. So what does the Supreme Court do? What, what, what is the decision? What is the rationale? Lester? Uh, Miller v. Alabama? Yes. It precludes change. The rationale is, oh, and the, the court stated that we're not going to let him. We're not going to let him go. He's not free, but you can't execute him, and you can't give him life without parole. And, and that forecloses any opportunity, as uh, Richard said, for future neurological, psychological. Because a juvenile is less mature, and mm -hmm. um, what else? 
the same rationale that the, the other cases discussed. It, it, exactly, exactly. But what did the Supreme Court hold? I still don't have any of you guys giving me the holding. No, that mandatory life imprisonment without parole for those under the age of 18 at the time of their crimes violates the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. So here's the question. Did the Supreme Court impose a flat ban on life sentences for kids who murder? No, no. right, John? No. So what was the precise holding? Um, I think it was to get rid of the mandatory, the thing that just happens, of course, and, and, and to say that you've got to have a transfer hearing. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. So let's think of it in terms of the Massachusetts statute. So we have Chapter 119 that we talked about where the, the uh, juvenile court does not have jurisdiction, right, of a kid who commits murder one or murder two who's between 14 and 17. Right? That case then goes to the Superior Court because Juvenile Court doesn't have, again, doesn't have jurisdiction. Um, like John Audrey, case gets tried in Superior Court, Commonwealth proves, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, murder one, 265-2, which is the statute that imposes mandatory life for defendants who uh, I'm sorry, for defendants who have committed murder one applies. So it's the combination of chapter 119, you know, that does away with, again, juvenile court jurisdiction and imposes superior court jurisdiction and, two, and chapter 265 that creates mandatory life sentences for juveniles. Um, no discretion, no hearing, right? Because when the case, at adjudication, if it's, you know, the defendant stands up, you know, what does the jury say? <laughs> Guilty in the first degree, that's it. There's no sentencing hearing because it's mandatory sentencing. Can that still happen according to Miller v. Alabama? Oh, no. Why not? So what does Miller v. Alabama say has to happen? I, I think really think that it just says, uh, but this is my simplest. This is my way of understanding it. There have, the mandatory life without parole is not is not sending a message that the juvenile can be re rehabilitated at all. It gives no hope to the juvenile. So there, if there can, if there's, there has to be some way that. So you can still impose as a judge, as a court, uh, a, a, a juvenile between 40, 14 and 17 can still get life. But he needs to get a sentence in here. That would do what, Ash? Like, what would the sentencing hearing be comprised of? What what sorts of, you know? Well, it wouldn't be things. mandatory. It, What's that? It wouldn't be mandatory. It wouldn't be a mandatory uh, sentencing. It would... No, but tell me about that sentencing hearing. What would it look like, Richard? Be a case by case review based on like the mitigating factors age, education, experience. It would look like the sentencing hearings that the YO kids get. All of those factors that we talked about that are in chapter 119 after the adjudication phase of a YO kid and, and that were the same as in the Kent US case, the same as in the old transfer hearings where the judge could hear anything and everything about this kid as well as the, the offense itself, and then decide, oh yeah, oh yeah, it was pretty bad, most horrible, you know, kind of case, uh, uh, plus this kid is, you know, uh, was, you know, maybe a day under 17, uh, plus this kid had, uh, you know, had 10 priors, plus this kid never went to school, plus he has no family, you know, uh, you know uh, all of the factors that might, might, might go to support a life sentence, or, you know, factors that go the other way, that would support, not support a life sentence. But here's the thing, again, in Massachusetts, like right now, unless, unless, and there are in the works, you know, proposed changes, 
but according to those two statutes, we, we have no, no procedure for a sentencing hearing after a murder one case. Because again, the kids in the murder one cases, they're getting the same procedures as an adult. So Massachusetts isn't the only state that has to decide how to comply with Miller v. Alabama. So again, Miller is not a flat ban. It doesn't mean no life sentences, sentences whatsoever. You, it, 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 it just means that you can't just have a flat ban without at least considering the juvenile's culpability in some kind of hearing. And the severity of the crime. And exactly, and that's part of the juvenile's you know, culpability issues, right? Of course, you haven't read the mass cases because they're for next week, right? Yeah. <laughs> was that? No, yeah, right? You can't have what? She was just asking about the flat ban, and I was just right. telling her it's, it's, you can't have man, you can't have it be mandatory. You have to have it where they take into the, all of, including the youth's home, prior history, all that stuff. There is a flat ban if it's non homicide, right? right? So a, a, a kid that commits anything. Other than murder other than murder, cannot get life. So, Jadita, your kid can't get life right. for rape. And then, they don't, and like I think we already said, even a flat ban for non-murder, but they also can't have an automatic life without parole for murder. That was the purpose there, right? That, absolutely. Yeah. No automatic life. But it's the same, you're saying the same thing, I think, Jeremiah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> a state, Tell the whole class. A state can say, if a juvenile commits murder, he automatically gets life without parole. That's right. You, you cannot have that. That's what Miller Alabama is saying. You can't. And wait, and wait, and, 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 that, and what? Have to have. What's the reason why we can't do that? After it goes Miller. to the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual, and it all goes into the culpability of a juvenile, his ability to appreciate what he did, the inability to determine where he comes from, and his house, that, you know, his family that affects him. So they're not saying that you can't sentence a juvenile to life without parole. They're just saying it can't be mandatory without taking all the factors into consideration. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You can't go straight from adjudication right. to sentence without a hearing to consider the juvenile's situation. You still may get there. He still may get there. Right. Absolutely. He still may uh, get there. So still all new stuff, even though you know the brain development stuff has been going on for quite some time. But um, you know practitioners are beginning to you know also to use it in other phases, you know as well. Um, for example, juveniles, you know, just understanding their rights in general, understanding Miranda. Um, being one, one case that I didn't give you that the Supreme Court um, considered a few years ago also was the JDB versus, I think it's South or North Carolina, one of the Carolinas, um, where um, uh, um, a 14-year-old was actually uh, in a school setting, you know, questioned. And the, um, you know, issue was should the um, court be able to consider, you know, the person's age in trying to determine you know, whether he or she understood, you know, his rights. Um, and the Supreme Court said yes, that age, you know, something about age is not just a mere chronological factor. The courts, again, you know, the, and it, it's going back to what the early juvenile court judges always did anyway. They always considered on a case, you said it before, Richard, I think you said case by case basis earlier in the, in the class, you know, they considered case by case basis this particular kid and his or her circumstances, and then what should we do? You know, the crime itself, and the, the, the kid, and the public safety, and all of that together, rather than, you know, um, not only mandatory sentences, but, you know, rather than likening um, all of the rights and procedures to what adults do, and then, you know, just kind of leaving it at that and thinking that, um, you know, children are just like miniature adults. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, they get right, they give them all these rights and they're just like adult trials. Well, in the end, what do we need a juvenile court for if that's the case? They can just be tried in the district courts and the superior courts. 
um, which is, you know, pre-juvenile court era. Lester. There's controversy today pursuant to mandatory sentencing for adults. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, because it goes to the, the giving the, the court, the trial courts, the trial judges who get to see and hear, observe the demeanor of the witnesses, weigh credibility. It gives them no discretion, no discretion at all. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's a, a mandatory across the board has been um, criticized. Well, they said that at the Middlesex jail. That the, right. That was a big problem. The attorney was saying that. Yeah. That's yeah. a big problem. And yeah. they're working on legislation, aren't they, to try to change, get oh, rid of it? Always. Always. It is the argument to have mandatory sentencing. Like, is it the, the deterrence factor? Supposedly. It's not deterrence. Working, but no. No, it really doesn't. Really doesn't deterrence. You know, that was one of the factors that was considered, you know, in death penalty and like cases as well, Terrence. So Tuesday, we'll do our Massachusetts cases. Um, take a look at, you know, some of the cases talk about this interested adult rule. Um, and uh, we'll talk about what that means again in terms of, again, the juvenile's capacity to understand and culpability and so forth. And then Thursday, we'll do review. Okay.